Hey everyone, welcome to Data Umbrella's webinar for October. I'm going to do a brief introduction, then Andreas will do his talk, and you can ask questions in the chat or the Q&A, and we will get them answered um, You know when there's a good time to sort of break for it. Um, and this webinar is being recorded, and it will probably be up in less than a day on our YouTube. Data Umbrella is a community for underrepresented persons in data science, and we are volunteer run. A little bit about me, I'm a statistician. Um, I have a degree in statistics and an MBA, and you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and GitHub as Reshma S. We do have a code of conduct, and we um, ask that you uh, contribute to making this a welcoming, friendly community for all, and that also applies to um, any conversations in the chat as well. There are various ways that you can support Data Umbrella. The first and foremost is to follow our code of conduct and contribute to making it a welcoming and collaborative space. We also have a Discord server. The link to it is on our website, and it's a great place to ask questions and answer questions there as well. Uh, you can also donate to our Open Collective um, to cover our operational costs. We have all of our um, recent events on YouTube, and we have a few playlists. One of the playlists is contributing to open source, and we had a bunch of webinars on contributing to either NumPy, Core Python, Pandas, Scikit-Learn. Um, check it out. We also have a career advice uh, playlist on YouTube where we've had a few um, really great speakers. It's, they've been fun events, so um, check them out. And this is just a sampling of some of our um, talks on YouTube. We also have a job board at jobs.dataumbrella.org. So feel free to check it out. And you can also post jobs on there if your company is hiring. On our website, there are a lot of resources that, that have been curated and um, for open source, for events, for inclusive language, accessibility and responsibility. and. Um, I, you know, feel free to check them out as well. We are on all social media platforms as Data Umbrella. The ones that are the most popular, I would say, are the ones that are highlighted in yellow, which is Twitter and LinkedIn. Meetup is the place to join to find out about upcoming events um, that is consistently shared there. YouTube is where um, the videos are posted, and I'm going to put some of these links in the chat after I finish my presentation. And we also have a newsletter, which I try to do every month, but it usually ends up being every two to three months. Um, so yeah, I'll share a link to that as well. Um, our next event, which is about two weeks from today, it's on a Wednesday though, I believe, um, it is with Marietta and it's Intro to Unit Testing and Continuous Integration. Marietta is actually the first women core contributor to Python. So it's a real pleasure that we will be having her there. And um, I asked her especially if she could do a presentation because we had a talk um, about pull requests and there were a lot of questions that came up on continuous integration. So this will be, um, this will be a really good talk. And today's talk is with Andreas Miller, um, taking the edge off of data science with Dabble. Um, Andreas is a principal research software developer engineer at Microsoft, where he works on the interface of the data science ecosystem and cloud infrastructure. Previously, he was an associate research scientist at Columbia Data Science Institute and also at the NYU Center for Data Science in New York. He is one of the core developers of the Scikit-Learn machine learning library, as well as being a member of the Scikit-Learn technical committee. And he is author of the book, Introduction to Machine Learning with Python. Um, you can find Andreas on LinkedIn, Twitter, and GitHub um, pretty easily. And with that, I'm going to turn off my mic and camera and hand it over. And again, if you have any questions, um, just put them in the chat and we will get them answered when there's a good sort of time to break. All right. Thanks for having me. Give me one second to figure out my slideshow. All right. 
looks like now everything is set. Cool. Um, well, so thanks for um, coming to my talk on Dabble and taking the edge off of data science with Dabble. And um, so thanks for the introduction, uh, Reshma. So before I get started with Dabble, I, I wanted to um, do a brief highlight on the second learn release 1.0, which is very related. Um, so as Reshma said, a lot of my work is related to making data science more accessible and like the practical aspects, in particular in the Python data science ecosystem. And I think we did a lot of really cool changes in scikit-learn uh, 1.0 that um, will help people uh, make data science easier. So it's been a long time um, for us to get to a stable version. And so we decided it's uh, finally time. There's not that many really, really big changes between the last version and the 1.0 version, but we felt we are really stable. And so we should really do a 1.0 version. There's a couple of cool changes that I want to talk about. Though. Um, most of the release work has actually been done by um, Adrian and by Olivier. Uh, I've been pretty hands off these days, but um, a lot of the things that we started working on uh, many years ago are now finally like coming to fruition. So a lot of the changes I want to highlight are really about usability because I think usability and um, is really, really important. Um, so some things that are a little bit more technical maybe, but I think are quite important is like, how do you write code using scikit-learn? And so um, you might have seen stuff like this where you have a model in scikit-learn that you instantiate a gradient boosting regressor, and then there's just a list of many different options. And you know, there's like, what do these numbers mean? 0 0.1, 131, none. And um, you would have always have to look at documentation to figure out what these means. And so basically with, um, I think Python 3.8, you can require keyword arguments to, um, so you can uh, forbid positional arguments and require arguments to be keyword only. And so for basically all of the models in scikit-learn starting 1.0, all the, um, parameters, the hyperparameters of the models are now keyword only so that you have to specify them. Um, as always, so 1.0 is actually not a breaking change. So the old code, code will still run for two more versions, but you get warnings if you use positional arguments. Um, but so basically we strongly encourage you to write the code at the bottom and not the code at the top because for anyone else trying to read your code, the one at the top is pretty much impossible to read. Another thing that I think is really important usability and that we've worked, we wanted to have for many years is calling consistency, which is interfa about interfacing better with pandas. So a lot of the recent changes are more about like, how do pandas and scikit-learn interact? And that's also something that Dabble really wants to um, uh, help with. And so, Before 1.0, basically, whenever scikit-learn saw a pandas data frame, it made it into a NumPy array and then worked with a NumPy array. But if you work with pandas data frames, very often you address the columns not by their position, but by their name. But scikit-learn completely ignored the names. From now on, um, it will be enforced that the names are consistent if you have column names. Um, and so here you can see that, let's say if I uh, try to scale my data, but, and the columns in the training set were A, B, C, and the columns in the test set are A, C, B, this now raises a warning in two versions it will raise an error. Because um, what this did in the past was basically, it just considered the first column to be the first column, the second column to be the second column, the third column to be the third column, no matter what the names were. And so this could really easily lead to bugs if you use pandas and you just work by column names because the order of the columns could change. And now we basically enforce that the order of the columns are consistent, that the name of the columns are consistent. And so um, it would be really interesting to see how many people discover bugs using this because I think this is something that's very common. Um, so I really encourage you obviously to give 
uh, version 1.0 a try in particular, see like how does this feature pan out for you if you're using pandas and um, are you getting a lot of warnings? Are you spurious warnings? Uh, do you find a lot of bugs in your code using this? Um, I'm not sure even if everybody was aware that before this, scikit-learn was basically ignoring column names, but now we're no longer ignoring them and we're really trying to enforce consistency. Oh, also, I don't think I can see the chat right now. So if there, let me see if I can make it work that I can see the chat. Um, no questions so far. No questions so far. OK. Um, cool. Now I can see the chat. So feel free to um, ask questions in the chat also. Another very related change is um, support for feature names. And so to um, support this column name consistency, so scikit-learn basically now finally knows about pandas column names. And it only took us, uh, I think, seven years or something since we wanted to do this. So if you fit a scalar, it will actually store the names in a new attribute called feature names in. And so then when you um, call predict or transform, it will check if the um, new data frame has consistent feature names. But what's more so is that you can get the feature names that come out of a transformation. So if you build a column transformer that contains various pre-processing steps, um, like scaling the data when hot encoding the data, here um, we have a pretty standard column transformer that does exactly these two things. So you scale the continuous variable and you one hot encode a categorical variable and um, now we can call, uh, after this was fit, we can call get feature names out and we will get actually the names of the features afterwards. So right now, this still uh, this preprocessor, the transform will create a NumPy array, but you can get the feature name, so you can create a pandas data frame. In future versions, we will give the option to directly output a pandas data frame, which is often what you would want. But at least now we have this information that tells you what these columns mean. Before that, we didn't really have them. In particular, if you have, oh, I'm missing a slide. Uh, in particular, if you have um, a complicated pipeline, um, say with several transformations and the end of model, the standard pair standard um, idiom you would use is you can slice off the end of the pipeline. So you can do pipeline um, square brackets column minus one. So you get the last, the second to last step in the pipeline and then call get feature names out on that. So if the last one is a model, the model will not have get feature names out, but the step before that will have get feature names out. And so you can see what are the features that actually go into the model and you can use that to interpret like model coefficients, and you can use that to um, interpret uh, feature importances and so on. So um, there's a question um, by uh, Pranjal, which is, uh, we're not using pandas data frames under the hood. We're, we're still using NumPy arrays, but we're keeping a list of columns separately. And um, one of the reasons is that I mean, so there's a couple of complications, and one of the reasons we're not producing pandas data frames is um, the, okay, one of the main reasons, I guess, is sparse data support, because um, sometimes we want to um, use sparse matrices, and the support for sparse matrices in pandas is not as good as in SciPy, and the formats of sparse matrices that are supported are, um, or less. Um, we are also trying to avoid memory copies uh, between different transformers. And so using NumPy arrays internally basically allows us to reduce the amount of memory copies. In many cases, it might be like the user might not care about memory copies so much and would rather have the user friendliness of outputting pandas data frames. Um, and so we want to give the user the option in the future to do that. But so far, everything is just NumPy plus a list of strings. But it's a list of strings that I think is uh, very useful. 
So I think this is actually one of the most exciting changes that this really relates to the things on Dabo I'll talk about later. Another thing that has been in scikit-learn for a while now, but people have not been super aware maybe, is the histogram gradient boosting. Um, and in the 1.0 release, it has been made stable. Before it was, in, uh, was called experimental, but it's actually been uh, quite stable for a bit now. So histogram gradient boosting is an implementation of uh, basically a re-implementation of a light GBM, which is a gradient boosting machine, which is um, very similar to XGBoost. So basically it's a fast implementation of gradient boosting. And so uh, a lot of people used to use XGBoost. Light GBM is a slightly faster implementation or it was at some point, the two are sort of competing. And now in scikit-learn, we have an implementation that is uh, basically as fast and um, as feature-rich as XGBoost and LightGBM. So there are some things that still are missing, I think, sparse matrix support. And I'm not sure if we added a quantile loss recently, but overall, histogram gradient boosting um, should be very competitive. It's also multi-threaded. And um, so if you use gradient boosting in scikit-learn, we still have the old gradient boosting class, but that's much, much slower. So you can see here, this is a log scale. Um, so the old cycle learn gradient boosting is like orders of magnitude slower and takes much more memory. So you should always use the histogram gradient boosting probably, and you will get um, performance that is comparable to like some of the other implementations like XGBoost and like GBM. There's a couple of more uh, things, um, but I mostly want to talk about Dabble today, but there's, we got um, spline features, we got really cool plotting support. You're not aware, scikit-learn recently added, more or less recently, maybe like a year and a half ago or something, added um, tools for plotting, like plotting rock curves, plotting um, uh, confusion matrices, plotting other things. Um, we added quantile regression and we added online, uh, Sorry, online one class SVM, I should have said. Um, so just check out the um, full change log. Reshma pasted it in the, um, in the chat. And uh, so there's lots of cool stuff. But the thing I'm really most excited about is like proper feature names. This will make working with pipelines and working with column transformers much, much nicer. So but let's go back to Dabble. I just wanted to show you all the awesome things in Scikit-Learn so you're really excited and you're trying out the new version. Um, but I also obviously want to make you excited about working with uh, Dabble, um, which is sort of my side project that I use to prototype some of the ideas for um, making machine learning more accessible and um, more approachable beyond what the things that we have in Scikit-Learn. So, the idea it, behind Dabble is that in a real-world machine learning uh, workflow, the model building is only a small part. Usually you start, or I, you should start with a problem statement. And from the data problem statement, you do some data collection. A lot of work is usually often spent on data collection. Then on data cleaning and visualization, exploratory data analysis is really, really critical for any ML or data science work. Um, then there's obviously the model building, and um, often like people try different models like random forest, linear models, gradient boosting, neural networks, uh, tune the hyperparameters, and uh, all kind of things, and uh, then evaluate the model um, using some accuracy or rock curves or things like this. And then finally, um, you usually want to evaluate your model in the context of your application. So as part of the process that you're actually interested in. You're never really interested in how accurate is my model or what does the rock curve look like? You usually want to solve a problem. And so you want to evaluate your model as part of your actual workflow. But this is not a straightforward process. This is usually um, more of a cycle. So I drew it here as a cycle, but you, actually it's more like a fully connected graph. At each step, you might go step to a previous step. So after building a model, you might go back to visualization and see like, 
oh, wh why, why is my model like this? C can I figure out why the data looks like this? Or maybe after visualization, you can see, uh, oh, there's these weird issues that I did in, in, in my data. Is something wrong with my data collection or my data cleaning? Or uh, maybe after you evaluate your model, you see that um, maybe the way you formulated the problem was not ideal. And so after each of these steps, you might go back to previous steps. And it's a very, very iterative process. Um, and in the machine learning and data science community, people really tend to hyper-focus on the model building. We have so many tools that are from model building, like Scikit-Learn is really focused on model building. You have all the deep learning libraries for model building. You have XGBoost and uh, LightGBM. And uh, you have so, so many things. Um, but really, model building is only a very small part. And it's often not even the most important part. More often, co collecting, the, like formulating the problem in the right way, collecting the right data, and uh, understanding the data are often much more important. And obviously, evaluating the, the um, model as part of the task that you actually want to uh, solve and see how your model fits into this task. And so the other thing parts, I think, are underserved, uh, in particular in the PyData community. So if you want to do exploratory analysis, um, one of the best tools I think you have right now is Seaborn. But if you do want to uh, do visualization for predictive modeling with Seaborn, I think it's still quite cumbersome. So here I am loading um, a data set that's a very standard sort of machine learning benchmark data set at the adult census. And let's say I want to just look at the continuous variables and um, see this is a binary classification data set. Um, using census variables to figuring out if uh, or predicting if uh, someone makes uh, more or less than $50,000 a year. Um, this is from, uh, I think, 1994. So this was sort of their indicator of, of middle class, I think. So this is a very straightforward data set containing its binary classification, continuous and categorical variables. And so a natural thing is to look at the distribution of the continuous variables. But if I want to plot this quickly, I think this is the most elegant code I could come up with, but it's still quite cumbersome. Um, and then if I want to train a, a simple machine learning model on it, this has been um, the code I wrote for training a linear model in scikit-learn. So what I'm doing here is I scale the data, I impute missing values, I one hot encode categorical variables, um, Actually, these days, I would maybe write it slightly differently because we fixed a couple of things in scikit-learn that make it a little bit nicer. Um, I combine the categorical and continuous variables, and then I do a pipeline with logistic regression, and then I do a grid search over um, the hyperparameter C, which is the regularization parameter. And so this is basically what you have to do if you really want to train a linear model with proper pre-processing using scikit-learn. And um, if you come from R and arts, a little bit simpler, but uh, I'm like, scikit-learn likes to be really, really explicit, but it's also really verbose. If my focus is not on the model building step, but really on the whole process, and I want to iterate quickly, I want to understand the data, this is really cumbersome. and um, I can write this down pretty easily, but I also like worked on scikit-learn a lot. For a lot of people, coming up with this code is probably like quite annoying. Um, and so I really want to make people write less code to do the obvious tasks. And that's the goal behind Dabble. There are some tools that have a similar goal. Um, mostly these are automatic uh, machine learning frameworks. One of my favorite open source machine uh, Frameworks for automatic machine learning is uh, Auto Scikit Learn, and I love Auto Scikit Learn. I love the work behind Auto Scikit Learn, but um, the automatic machine learning in um, that that is um, sort of 
most widely discussed and um, most widely published in the scientific literature really focuses on finding the best model. So if here, again, I'm using sort of a standard toy data set. This is from the Auto Escalon website from, it's a while ago, so it might uh, run a little bit faster now, but it uses a very simple toy data set with just a couple of hundreds of data points. And um, it runs for about an hour before it gives you any results. It gives you a very accurate model, but it really does not give you um, a very interactive process. If your data set is fixed and you want to squeeze out the last performance of your data set, this is the right thing to do. So if you want to win a Kaggle competition, maybe this is the right thing to do. Or if someone gives you a machine learning benchmark, this is the right thing to do. But in the real world, the data set is not fixed. You collected the data set. The featureization of the data set is not fixed. The information you include is not fixed. Um, not even the problem description might be fixed. And so I would argue it's more important to iterate quickly and um, try out different things and have a more human in the loop process. And so once you settled on everything, maybe run an automatic machine learning framework that squeezes out the last bit of performance. But that's, again, hyper-focusing on the model building process, which I don't think you should. So my um, uh, kind of approach here has I try to encode in Dabble, which stands for Data Analysis Baseline Library. And the idea is to come up with a baseline analysis and a baseline model for um, a machine learning or data science task. And the idea is to walk through the cycle as often and as quickly as possible and not hyper-focus on any individual step. And maybe we're not going to do the best in each of them, but we're going to do something good and we're going to do it easily so we can spend more brain power on the important parts, on the problem statement, on the data collection, on the application itself. And so for data cleaning, there's a function double.clean. It takes a sort of dirty data frame, it spits out a clean data frame. For visualization, there's double.plot. Double.plot tries to understand um, the tasks and tries to show you plots that are as informative as possible. It's a single line, and you get visualization. For model building, there's actually two classifiers. There's a simple classifier and then any classifier that does some um, relatively simple automatic machine learning, but it, it's really aimed at giving you results as quickly as possible. And then for model evaluation, there's devil.explain that um, gives you all kinds of different metric, plots, metrics, plots, feature importances, plots, partial dependence, plots, all this kind of standard evaluation that you would want to do after you train the model. For the actual evaluation as part of your application, unfortunately, you still have to think because that's very specific and that's where you should spend your brain power is about like, how do I do proper evaluation of my whole workflow? What will be the consequence on my customers, my product, my patients, whatever you're working on? So, and for each of these steps, it's sort of a best effort. And um, over the years that I've worked on Dabble, actually in the beginning I started focusing on the model building. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the research behind the model building in any classifier. But since then, I really uh, pivoted to working on the clean and plot parts more because I found that the clean and plot parts are really the, um, really the things that people get stuck with and like, so far, I found dabble.plot really the most useful part of my own work. Um, dabble.explain in the past has not been as useful as I wanted to because scikit-learn was very opaque in terms of what do the columns mean. With the changes in 1.0, I'll actually be able to completely rewrite dabble.explain 
And um, unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to do that yet. But now Devil.explain Explain can um, inspect the model much easier because we have these um, column names on our preprocessors. Okay, let's go through a little bit to uh, through the separate steps of what Devil can do for you. So clean can um, detect types. That's actually one of the most interesting things, I think, is automatically figure out someone threw a CSV file at you and um, you're like, what are the categorical variables? What are the continuous variables? Um, what are variables that are mostly continuous, but then so there, there's maybe some strings in there, like maybe missing was encoded as a string, or maybe someone put in NA or NA with a slash or NA in lowercase, or um, maybe they put in, oh, today I didn't measure this. And so um, or cleaning up rare values, um, cleaning up indices, like if you read and write CSV files a bunch of times with pandas, maybe someone um, wrote out the index and then resplit the data and wrote out the index again. And so you have three columns that are actually the index. Uh, I've definitely seen that happen. So you probably want to drop these for any machine learning tasks or visualization. Uh, often you have near constant values that you want to drop. And so um, that will mostly use uh, heuristics to figure out um, what types to uh, to infer. There's actually a really, really cool paper that's been like maybe a year ago um, that I linked here at the bottom by um, Prash and Arun. Um, they do an ML approach towards detecting types, which is um, really, really cool. They actually collected a bunch of really dirty data CSV files and trying to figure out what is the meaning of the columns. And that's one of the things that I found is often a big stumbling block is getting the types of the columns right. One of the things that's actually quite hard is if there is an integer, figure out is the integer ordinal or categorical or is it a count or is it maybe an index? And this is something you can't really easily tell. Other things like figuring out if a column is a mix of strings and uh, numbers, it's more about convenience. If someone um, puts an NA somewhere and you don't know that they put an A and sometimes they capitalize and sometimes they don't, um, that's really annoying to deal with with pandas. Devil does that automatically for you. Here's an example on the Ames housing data set, which is sort of a sort of a little bit more dirty standard machine learning benchmark data set. And um, so it has uh, 82 columns. And you can see if you call that a lot clean on it, it'll um, detect that there's 23 uh, continuous, uh, categor uh, continuous variables. There's 41 categor 40 categorical variables, three low cardinality ints that could be either categorical or continuous, and 13 useless variables. And so at the bottom, you can see that useless variables um, these are ones that are basically constant and um, they're just not informative. For pre-processing, there's two options in Dabble. You can either just run the, um, the simple model, uh, sort of the any classifier or the simple classifier. The classifier will actually do all the data cleaning and all the pre-processing for you. If you want Dabble to just take care of the preprocessing and you want to do the model building yourself, there's a preprocessor. The easy preprocessor will do a type detection and then assemble a, col a scikit learn column transformer for you that does the correct kind of preprocessing for the types in your data. So it detects what's continuous, what's categorical, what kind of missing values are present, and then it does something, uh, then it gives you this column transformer back that uh, does the preprocessing for uh, any scikit learn model. All right, so let's go to visualization. So as I said, visualization is one of the things that I've been really, really passionate about uh, recently um, and spend uh, quite a bit of time on. So if you don't try anything else, try dabble.plot. Read a CSV file or your parquet file, your SQL database, whatever, and just call dabble.plot um, with the target column. So it takes 
a data frame and then either regression or classification target. Here's what it produces on the adult data set that we saw earlier. So here you can see mosaic plots for all the categorical variables. Um, so each of these plots here, you see the mouse? I think you, you can see the mouse. Um, uh, corresponds to one categorical variable, so like the relationship status of the person. Um, you have two classes, the greater than 50K and the less than 50K class. And you can see um, the different values of the cate category, like husband, wife, not in a relationship, unmarried, um, his children, and so on. So I like these mosaic plots because they tell you um, the distribution of the target, but also the distribution in the data. So you can see that um, in this data set, husbands are much overrepresented compared to wives. And you can also see that husbands are um, actually, let me see, they're, the husband ha is as uh, the frequency of the greater than 50K uh, class is, um, actually a little bit lower than for wife. If, if you just look at gender, you can see men are overrepresented, uh, but men are actually um, more, uh, more frequently in the greater than 50K class than women by a factor of two even. And so here, we could just give it the CSV file and the target, and it picks out, so it does uh, detection of the feature types, and it tries to find what is the best way to visualize. You also get for the continuous variables here, these histograms and a pair plot because it only found two interesting um, continuous variables, age and capital gain. So just with this one line, you already get a uh, reasonable overview of your data. Um, and from there, you can zoom in and look at more specific aspects. If you have more continuous variables, there's a lot of pairwise plots. It will show you the top feature interactions. It actually tries to find um, pairs of variables that are most informative together. So this is a different data set. And so it, that's very high dimensional and it tries to show you the, the most interesting projections. So if you looked at um, a scatter matrix, if you have hundred features, you get um, 10,000 plots. It's not very useful. Um, Double picks out by default the four most interesting plots, um, the four most combina uh, interesting combinations, but you can configure it to show more. It also shows you uh, PCA directions. And something that I find quite interesting is um, LDA here standing for linear discriminant analysis. So LDA are linear projections that are very discriminant. And so what you can see here in this data set, which is maybe not obvious from the other plots, is that um, you can actually linearly separate the classes quite easily um, in like two dimensions. So there's a, or maybe in three dimensions. So there's like a three dimensional pro linear projection that completely separates the classes, um, which is, uh, yeah, I, I would say quite interesting. I found LDA visualizations to be really useful and they're not something that people, um, use that often, but uh, double.plot will surface them automatically. All right, so then for uh, model building, as I said, there's uh, two classes. One is a simple classifier. The simple classifier is meant to give you basically instantaneous results, and it will give you a dummy model, an eighth base, decision tree stumps, and linear models. And so this, um, will run within seconds, it will run the fastest model first. And so you will get something like the dummy classifier, which just tells you how accurate is it if you make a constant prediction. And so on this data set, the adult data set again, um, you can see that, oh, if I always predict the income is less than 50K, I get an accuracy of um, nearly 76%. If I um, use a Gaussian eighth base model, I actually get a worse result. If I get a multinomial, uh, Naive base model, I get a better result. And um, well, in terms of accuracy, and then here's results for different uh, very small decision trees. It also gives you um, 
other metrics, because here you can see that actually the Gaussian naive base in terms of accuracy, it's not doing very well. But accuracy is not really a good measure if you have imbalanced classification. And you can see that in terms of average precision, um, uh, macro recall or um, area under the rock curve actually does better than doing the dummy classifier. And so by default, I think the metric uh, it uses is um, recall macro for picking the best model. Recall macro is also called bal uh, balanced accuracy. Um, and then there's, as I said, there's also some um, automatic ML in there. It's actually automatic ML that's meant to be very, very quick. Um, it uses a portfolio. And so this port the, uh, a paper that really explains this method well is Practical Automatic Machine Learning for the AutoML Challenge 2018 by Feuerer et al. Uh, this is the Feuerer and Hatter are the people behind um, Auto SK Learn. And so what they did for this competition is they um, run hyperparameter optimization across basically all of scikit-learn on a large benchmark suit. Um, the, if, what we did is we use OpenML CC18. And we found for each of these data sets in this benchmark suit, the best model. Then we create a portfolio that um, is small, but overall performs well. So what this means is that um, if I take the top K uh, of these models, say I want to have the top 10 best performing models, um, then I will have one that performs well across all the data sets. And so the idea is to create a small subset of all the models that, um, let's say of size five or 10, and then run search just over these models. Uh, turns out in practice, this is mostly gradient boosting. So um, the, the portfolio that's in um, Devil right now, it's automatically optimized using OpenML CC18. Um, but actually, it's, yeah, it's nearly all gradient boosting with a little bit of support vector machines and a linear model thrown in, something like that. Um, what we do then with this portfolio is that we do successive halving. Successive halving is an alternative to doing grid search or randomized search where you um, evaluate not on the full data set, but on um, increasingly big parts of the data set. So you um, subsample your data set to like say 10% of your data. You evaluate all your candidates. Let's say we have in this graph here, um, eight candidate configurations or eight candidate um, classifiers. And um, we evaluate them on the small subset of the data. We then um, keep the best performing half and throw out the worst performing half. So we basically, we run cross-validation. And if we had eight models, we keep the four that perform best. And then we increase the subset of the data that um, we used. So usually we, in each step, we double the amount of data we use and we half the amount of um, configurations. That's why it's called successive halving. In practice, actually uh, using three instead of two is better, but uh, the, the names are all in terms of doing everything with uh, halving and doubling. And so each step you increase the number of um, samples in your data set where in the end, you could end up with one configuration that you evaluate on the whole data set. And so this whole search procedure, uh, because you're halving the number of models while you're doubling the um, number of samples you're using, takes as long, depending on your configuration, either as long as running two models or sometimes even just as long as running a single model. And so this is really, really fast. So you're finding a good model in the same time it usually would take you to just evaluate a single model. It's not guaranteed to find the actual optimum, but the guarantees are quite good. And um, it gives you results really, really quickly. Um, 
All right. So, oh, uh, Reshma, can you remind me uh, what time we end and what time we want to do Q and A? Uh, really, just whenever is convenient for you. Um, it's fine. The, just one thing uh, on the bottom, if you just want to hit hide on the, your screen, yeah, it's just easy to see what's there. Yeah. Oh, I, I thought that wasn't on your screen. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, uh, I did work, uh, some work a couple of years ago in terms of um, evaluating this kind of um, portfolio building for um, like per model. So doing it for random forest, for gradient boosting, for SVMs and so on. And we found that um, doing it really gives you really good results um, so what our work is, we call it uh, multiple defaults. So this is the red work and we compared it against um, model-based optimization, random search. And we found that if we just consider even like um, four configurations or eight configurations, we usually get uh, very good competitive results. And so um, basically it's enough to, um, restrict yourself to a very small subset of the configurations and you'll still get very good results. Um, and this is for that reason, um, I've sort of been like a little bit less interested in the model search because basically you can have a list of like 10 different configurations of XGBoost. You can run successive halving on them and you'll probably find a good model um, or a good enough model. There's some other automatic techniques that will give you better performance, but usually the thing that's really critical is not really squeezing the last, last bit out of the model, but really understanding your data. So um, the other part of understanding your data is understanding your model and what is the signal that your model picked out of the um, out of the data. And so Dabble has this explain method, which uh, right now it works for the any classifier. Um, ideally, it would also work for any scikit learn estimator. Um, now with the release of 1.0, this will um, hopefully work in the next version of Dabble, uh, depending on how much time I have. The idea behind explain is to give you all of the metrics that you would want, all of the model interpretability, um, for any arbitrary scikit-learn pipeline. Again, before uh, 1.0, that was a little bit hard because we didn't have these uh, column names. Now it should be uh, easier. And so what it produces is like the standard um, classification report, confusion matrix, confusion matrix plot, rock curve plots, uh, precision recall uh, uh, plots for all the different classes. And so these are just, sort of just uh, uh, the standard things in terms of metrics you would look, uh, look at. And then model exp explanations like um, for random forest, the, um, the impurity-based feature importances. This is what's called SKLR and feature importances. Um, Actually, I would recommend not doing the, using these, but instead using the permutation importances. Permutation importances can are more reliable and can be computed for any model. So Dabble will compute the permutation importances for you and then also show you partial dependence plots. Um, and so all of this together, hopefully, will give you a lot of insight about the model and what signal the model picked out from your data in addition to the uh, original insight of the data that you had from, um, uh, from just plotting the data using double.plot. Okay, so one question, which is what is permutation importance? Um, permutation importance is a way to measure feature importance. So it says, how important is a particular feature for predicting the target? And um, the way it works is that it ret retrains a model with um, a fake data set where one of the features got permuted. So it got shuffled. And so the information is completely destroyed. 
And then you train the model on this and you can see how much worse does the model perform if I destroy the information in this feature. And you can see here, this is from the Titanic data set. Um, you can see that uh, sex is the main feature that is important. So this tells you that um, um, whether, yeah, so that uh, gender is the most deciding factor. It tells you that if I, if you um, destroy the information in gender, the model will perform much, much worse. Meaning gender is the most informative feature in the Titanic data set about who gets rescued. I mean, uh, pretty well known. If you, um, at the top plot actually here, I'm showing um, the partially, sorry, the permutation, not the permutation importance, the um, impurity based importance. Um, we actually, for this experiment, this is an, one of the examples on the scikit-learn uh, website. You can see there's actually a random number uh, put in as a random feature that's just completely uninformative. The, Impurity importance tells us the random number is the most informative feature, which is actually like which is obviously wrong, and um, it tells us that um, the next one is fair and the next one is uh, age, and only then it gives us um, male and female. Um, so this is probably a distorted version of what's actually important and what is actually important. The most predictive feature is actually sex. Um, yeah, you can. So all of these are basically invocations of scikit-learn. And while I was developing Dabble, we made using these things with scikit-learn easier and easier over time. And so you can always compute permutation importance just with scikit-learn. Please use it. It's an amazing tool. Um, always use it. The idea behind Dabble is to make it just easier to apply and just give you some nice plots that show you all the important things right off the bat. Cool. Um, so now we come to some things that I hope would be released by this talk, but unfortunately I didn't have time to, to finish them up. But something that I'm quite interested in uh, and will include the next version is alluvian, um, uh, alluvial plots. These are also known sometimes as Sankey diagrams. Well, actually, Sankey diagrams are some, well, this is a some more generic version. So these uh, alluvial plots are ways to show um, interactions between categorical variables. Here I go back to um, the uh, census data set. And so the census data set has a lot of these categorical variables like um, the relationship, the marital status, the occupation, the education, the gender. And so we saw with these mosaic plots, we can see that um, we could see the distribution of um, the different categories as well as um, the target outcome. So we could see with that one, oh, there's more men in this data set than women and the men on average are more likely to make, uh, are in the higher salary group, um, which is basically what you see here. But then there might be higher order effects, uh, say about like, how do the, these uh, things relate? So what about the men that that, that um, have different kinds of degrees? Like um, that's having a pretty good degree make a difference between having a man and uh, being a man and a woman. Um, does being married make a difference between a man and a woman, how it impacts your salary, and so on. And um, so allu uh, alluvial plots um, are a way to show the interactions between different categorical variables and uh, how they impact the outcome. And so this is currently the development version. And basically you can see the flow of different categories. So here, each of these bands corresponds to one uh, combination. So for example, this one here are the, um, um, are the people that are husbands and divorced. And um, 
that, that are uh, husbands and divorced and in the lower income class. Uh, for example, um, you can see for uh, the distribution in never married is very different from the um, married uh, distribution and so on. And so I'm still trying to figure out how to present present the information in the best way because um, the actual way how you order the different rows and columns makes a lot of difference. And so that's why I haven't released it yet because I'm still sort of figuring out the details of how to how best to organize it. Of course, it's a lot of information um, and I want to make sure it's presented in the way that's most useful. Cool. Um, so for future goals, uh, for Dapple, are um, support for time series and text data, redoing the um, inspection module with scikit-learn, uh, sorry, not inspection, the explain part of Dabble with scikit-learn 1.0, because we have now much more features in scikit-learn to support this. Uh, I want to improve the portfolios uh, to be more time sensitive, and um, I want to work on more explainable models. In addition, obviously, to expanding the plotting, which I'm like sort of the things that I'm mostly working on right now. So check out the documentation at dabble.github.io. Uh, you can pip install dabble to get it. And if you don't try anything else, just try dabble.plot on your data set. And um, if it does something useful, let me know. If it doesn't do something useful, also let me know. Uh, so far, I found it a really nice tool to get a good idea a good initial view of the data set, and it should run very, very quickly and uh, give you some good ideas. All right. That, that was all for today. Um, I'm happy to take any more questions. Hey, everyone. So if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. In the meantime, I have some questions. Um, I actually did try Dabble about a year ago. Um, so uh, I, I really, uh, really, um, enjoyed it and so one of the, the first question i have is um can you talk about contributing to dabble and um you know maybe like go to your code base and see how people can open up issues and and such sure um so one of the things that's uh i'm still sharing am i not um yes One of the nice things, um, sorry, uh, why did that not work? Is that um, because it's a much smaller uh, project than Scikit-Learn and less mature, uh, there's a lot more to do. And so there's a lot of like low hanging fruits and like easy things you could fix. Uh, there's a couple of, there's a bunch of issues uh, open that you could um, could address. There's uh, many improvements that you can make. So, and the data, the code base is not as complicated yet. Uh, one of the downsides is I'm one of basically the only person reviewing pull requests, and I'm also a little bit busy, so I can be uh, somewhat slow. So, it's important for you if you if you want to contribute to be um, maybe a little bit. Uh, more independent in getting getting started and uh, working on it by yourself because um, I right now I don't have the time to give a lot of very immediate feedback, but there's a lot of different problems that you can um, uh, like pick up, work on, and uh, send pull requests. I'm really happy to discuss the pull requests, and uh, also there's a lot of like um, usability that you can be improved if you run to issues of just reporting issues, reporting data set specific issues, um, help make the project better. And so, um, yeah, th there's a lot of low hanging fruit, a lot of things you can fix. And um, also just writing doc more documentation, writing more user guides. Um, yeah, a lot of places to contribute. And um, the bar to contributing is much lower than I could learn. But on the other hand, um, it might take a little bit longer until you get a get a reply. So I had this question on my list, and I see that someone else has also posted it in chat as well, which is, have you thought about making the plots interactive? Yeah, that would be amazing. So 
there's actually another project that is, has like similar ideas. Uh, it's called Lux and it's really awesome. Uh, check it out. By um, the way, we're having the speaker from Lux speak just in November. So just to put it out there. Awesome. Yeah. So Babel is built on Matplotlib. Uh, making the things interactive with Matplotlib is quite tricky. And um, also, it's not so responsive. Ideally, for interactive plots, you want to do it in JavaScript and like have widgets to do that. But that usually requires, so, but that means two things. One is that um, you probably have to install an IPython widget, which makes it, which is like, you need to install like a Node.js uh, application probably. And um, so that's like a little bit trickier to do. And then also it will not necessarily run in different notebook environments. So it might run in, um, in Jupyter Notebook, but then not in Jupyter Lab or not in Google Colab or uh, in you know, um, Azure Notebooks, which I'm working on sometimes this, these days is uh, Azure Machine Learning. And so basically if, or in VS Code. So basically if you um, write custom visualizations, it's, um, you, you have to do, make sure that it is supported in each uh, notebook uh, interface and uh, the user will probably need to install some uh, widget plugin. Yeah, Plotly is quite nice for interactive visualizations. Um, and I consider like, it would probably be nice to replace all of the Matplotlib with Plotly in Dabble, but it's also gonna be a lot of work. And I just, I, I haven't done that. I'm not sure if my JavaScript is good enough to actually do that. Uh, again, it will make installation probably quite a bit harder because it will require custom JavaScript code and it will require um, notebook specific code. So um, yeah, I think, so the author of Lux told me that um, they spend a lot of time and effort trying to make sure their widgets work everywhere and they have a lot of issues with installation. It's probably worth it for the interactivity, um, but it's not the, it's not the battle I was picking first. So um, yeah, maybe we'll come back to the interactive uh, plots in a minute because I definitely have a lot of thoughts on it. I, nowadays, I only do interactive plots because it's so much easier to put your mouse over and try to understand what's going on. Um, another question in the Q&A is, um, what is your opinion on using permutation importances versus shapely regression versus relative weights importance? Can, I'm not sure if I know relative weights importance. Um, okay. Um, and so. Okay. Uh, maybe they mean regression coefficients importance. Um, maybe the person who asked that can um, clarify in the chat. Um, um, so, I mean, shapely values certainly also are useful. I haven't entirely seen um, evidence that shapely values are more useful than permutation importance. What shape you values give you is a more local explanation. So if you're interested in local explanations, I would probably use shape, shapely values. Um, there's, I mean, and there's there's nothing wrong with, with using those. Um, I would be really interested to see more. Um, the thing is, it's very hard to evaluate feature importances, like really hard, because um, they're an explainability tool. And so really you want to um, evaluate how users react to seeing the explanations. And um, so that, yeah, I'm not, that's very hard to evaluate. And so 
I'm not sure what exactly the evaluation would be that would convince me that one or the other is better. Um, but yeah, but both are good. So the comment is relative weights uses PCA first to remove the multicollinearity and then regular regression. Ah, uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's also, that's, that's also, that's a sort of classic method. Um, the, uh, I think for linear models, that's good. Um, and I think actually, I'm like, I think under some assumptions, you might get uh, the same thing as permutation importance. If like, maybe if the, un I'm not sure if the underlying true model needs to be linear or something, but you can get the, um, but it obviously only works for, um, li for linear uh, models. The other question is, do alluvial plots ca use causal modeling to detect the relationships between predictors? No. no. It's just the raw data. Um, I mean, you could also try to discover causal relationships, but that's not, basically the idea is just to, sh just to show the data. Um, and show the data in a way that is um, useful for humans, but also doesn't in, doesn't induce any like specific biases. So show the data as raw as possible. Um, you could certainly try to. Um, I mean, it, it would be interesting to also try to discover causal graphs and then show causal graphs. Um, but that is sort of a much more opinionated view, maybe, um, of what's going on. So I have a um, sort of a project question, which is, is Dabble something that could have been part of scikit-learn or just the way that, that it's structured, it wouldn't, it wouldn't fit in with the scikit-learn project as it is? So in a sense, it, it couldn't um, because it's too opinionated and it has heuristics. Scikit-learn doesn't like to be opinionated. And Scikit-learn just pro basically try, likes to provide textbook tools. Um, whereas Dabble uses heuristics to figure out like best effort things. So it tries to figure out, well, is this a categorical variable or is this a continuous variable? And it tries to do some tests and it usually will work, but it might not always work. In scikit-learn, we really don't, not, don't try to do kind of these things. Um, like the behavior in scikit-learn should be easy to understand and um, like very clear cut, whereas, um, yeah, in Dabble, I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for the users with more magic. Um, also, there's like some hard-coded things in there, like, oh, fast model. Like, here are three models that are always interesting to run that are fast. Scikit-learn wouldn't like to do that. Um, or the um, imputation strategy, like basically the preprocessing that figures out how to do um, like how to do the scaling and what hot encoding and so on. These are like, um, these are very opinionated in a sense in that they, they say, oh, if you do this kind of pre-processing, it's probably going to be fine. Um, and again, this is sort of best effort and scikit-learn doesn't do this, this kind of thing. Um, when I started Dabble, there was also no plotting code in, um, in scikit-learn. And there was no dependency on pandas in scikit-learn. Um, so that, uh, that were also two reasons right now. Um, th these reasons are gone um, because sort of scikit-learn pushed a lot more in the direction of 
what I'm trying to do with Dabble, which is great. I mean, I would love all of these for all of these things to be in Scikit-Learn. And uh, I sort of successfully got some of them in there, like the plotting stuff, for example. Um, so before we didn't have plotting for a rock curve and you had to write your own rock curve plotting, which is really annoying every time you want to plot a rock curve. Now Scikit-Learn can plot a rock curve for you. Um, Yeah, um, but so yeah, but so the more opinionated things um, could go in there. The other thing is that I was moving fast, uh, or at least at, initially I was moving much faster in Scikit Learn uh, to add things like the um, feature names. So that has inside some hacks to make feature names work in Scikit Learn because I didn't want to wait three more years to get feature names and work with pandas data frames. So because the Lux event is coming up in about six weeks, um, I'm just curious to know um, how Lux would like sort of um, complement Dabble or fit in. Um, I'm just curious to know sort of like what to expect and what questions I can ask the Lux speaker as well. <laughs> so... Lux does only do visualization, and um, but it does it much more interactively, and um, so there's they have basically a way to help people discover interesting visualizations uh, interactively, and also they have a language for expressing intent about like what do you care about, so that um, well so. Whereas in Dabble, the intent is, I want to predict this column. So that, uh, Lux is a more generic visualization tool where Dabble is very focused on supervised learning. So um, the intent in Dabble is, I want to do this regression or classification problem. And then Dabble shows you like, here are all the things that might be interesting for this regression or classification problem. And by the way, I detected all the types of all the features for you. Whereas, um, in uh, in Lux, it's more about here are some things that are interesting, and depending on what you think about these, you can click around and you can find more detail, and you can find um, visualizations that better capture the thing that you're interested in. Whereas in somewhat ironically in Dabble, it's not very easy to iterate on the visualizations. The visualizations are a little bit more like um, uh, one shot gives you like a lot of stuff, but then if you want to zoom in, you have to um, write a little bit more code. So in a sense, Lux does, does the iterative visualization process uh, better than Dabble. But it's like, oh, yeah. OK. Um, so uh, another question that I had was, do you think that Dabble is sort of like the next step in say data science slash machine learning, which is like interpreting it because it seems like that is something that is maybe missing in the, um, in the education. Like there's tools to make things, you know, to run supervised learning or whatever, but actually understanding what's happening better. Yeah, so um, I mean, one of the things I push for is I could learn is to have more model inspection tools like the permutation importance and like ice plots um, and more generic partially dependence plots. These are all things that um, got added while I was working at Columbia um, with some project that I was working on then. Uh, and so the tools are there mostly for postdoc inspection. And of course there's uh, like the SHAP tools um, and I think people are using these tools actually quite extensively already. Um, but there's the other side, which is actually interpretable models. So building models that are uh, interpretable from the ground up. And there's been less, um, less adoption of that, I think. Uh, some of my colleagues at MSR have worked on something called explainable gradient boosting. And it's basically um, a gradient boosting model that produces an additive model, which is really nice. And uh, they get really good results. So this is um, uh, Rich Karana's group. And they have open source implementations. And I think that's 
that's pretty neat. So basically, um, the idea of additive models is that you can have a model that is completely expressed by their partially dependent spots. So if you show the partially dependent spots, that is everything there is, and they're not hiding anything. Um, yeah, so basically, I think having more tools for interpretable models uh, would be nice. Um, and like popularizing them more would be nice. Yeah, you know, I think that's really great. I don't know if you've been following the conversation, but, um, you know, something that some people are working on is actually adding alt text to visualizations um, on, say, scikit-learn, right? And so the conversation sort of progressed, which is, okay, how do we describe a visualization? Like, is it just, you know, that it's a, that it's a line plot or do we, next we actually have to sort of, you know, the user or the reader, it's like, well, what exactly do we want to take away from this visualization? And looking at some of the plots in Scikit-Learn, realize it's actually quite difficult to, I'm like, okay, what should I, what should I take away from this graph? You know, like I see it, I see the lines, I see the clusters. What am I supposed to know from it? If, especially if it's a, a really complex algorithm that I'm not as familiar with. Um, and I'm just sort of curious if, um, maybe, you know, this work in Dabble will, will help that as well. Like maybe, you know, knowing that, knowing that visualizations need alt text could actually help with that as well. Well, I mean, that, that's, um, I feel it's a little bit orthogonal to what I was trying to do, where I was trying to find what is interesting, whereas, um, I mean, there's obviously there's like a whole area of visualization that's about finding interesting, uh, like what does it mean to be interesting? For the alt text, you need to not only show what is interesting, you need to figure out what is interesting, but then you also need to interpret it, right? You need to, if I could um, write like a plain text um, explanation of the plot, Maybe I wouldn't even want to show the plot anymore. I would just give you the text because um, like the text can express much more. Like if I can tell, if I um, can create a text that says, oh, um, this model is mostly explained by the interactions between uh, age and gender. That's, and, and then uh, that would be super useful. I don't know, and I don't need to worry about what plot do I need to use to to do that, but um, that sort of requires a lot of uh, like judgment because it's usually not that easy because you need to just define like what is a what is the cutoff or what what is the cutoff that makes sense to summarize something. Um, basically, yeah. I think it seems very hard to interpret a plot, like much harder than to generate it. Um, like for each plot, I guess you could think about, okay, what is the question I'm going to ask this plot? And then you can write down, okay, what heuristics would I use to answer this question? But um, if you do, if you want to do a scatter plot, like let's say I do a scatter plot. And the outcomes I can see are like the classes are very overlapping or the two features are very correlated or the classes are not overlapping at all or the distribution of the classes is very uneven or the density is really non-Gaussian or, you know, there's like so many things I could see in a scatter plot or like, oh, there's a weird grid structure or like, well, there's like... Um, I think there was like a plotting competition where um, if you actually did a 2D scatter plot, it showed like a monkey or something, an image of a monkey. And like, so it, the um, to see if students actually looked at the data. And so um, you need like full image understanding plus machine learning knowledge to create a, generate a useful text automatically. I mean, I think it's good if you like for documentation, I think um, if you write like documentation or paper or something, 
you should write the alt text and writing the alt text will tell you if your visualization is any good. Um, but doing it automatically seems very hard. I agree. I was really sort of surprised and I can appreciate like how much more complex it is to have visualization and um, just trying to write alt text thing and just saying, am I interpreting this right? Like, am I seeing what I should be seeing? Um, and that's, um, yeah, it really opened a whole no whole door of what, um, you know, I guess what people can like learn from, you know, scikit-learn and other um, libraries. I, I guess sometimes it's just focus on getting the code working and okay, here's the output and like, wait, it's, it's, it's much more complex than that. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I think second learn the examples are actually pretty high quality and we often put a lot of effort into um, making making a good plot that shows the thing that we want to show. So a lot of thought went into producing the plot. So ideally, it should be possible to write an alt text, but that's only because so much thought went into what is it that we actually want to show. And uh, like, if you present a plot to anyone, if you can't write an alt text for it, then it probably means like it's not that clear what the plot shows. And if you, it's not that clear what the plot shows, why are you showing it to someone else? I mean, if you say like, if you're asking them, what does this show? Okay, it makes sense. But if you're showing like in a presentation, look at this plot, probably you want, you want to mean something by it, right? And so, um, yeah. So um, we are nearing the end. This is like the last chance for people. If you have any questions, um, ask on chat. Um, and you know, otherwise, um, this is being recorded. Um, I hope to get it up on YouTube in less than 24 hours. Um, I see no questions coming in. I, I want to thank you so much for doing the presentation. Um, it's been it's been on the list for a while. So <laughs> if you have any closing words. Um, Go for it. Uh, not really. I mean, th thanks all for coming. And I really, I would appreciate people trying out, trying out the plotting. If not, also try out scikit-learn 1.0. And uh, feedback is really what makes uh, open source work. And obviously participating. But one of the easiest, lowest barrier ways to participating is feedback. So um, try, uh, try out scikit-learn 1.0. Do you get annoying warnings? Do you get useful warnings? Uh, tell us on the issue tracker, tell us on Twitter, and um, yeah, and, and hopefully enjoy it. So Julie says, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. Also love the conversation around meaningful viz and how to interpret. Thank you. Um, it's always nice to have like a casual conversation at the end. And sometimes actually this part doesn't get recorded. So thank you for staying, um, for staying you know, as long as you did. And with that, I will, um, I will stop the recording. <laughs>